thanks Jennifer and thanks to LightMed for allowing us to um, participate in this um, webinar. I'll introduce our agenda and our and my co-speaker. So, um, Alin Edmondson, she's a research student and a medical student, fourth year med student out of uh, University of Dalhousie in New Brunswick, Atlantic, Canada. And she will be uh, talking to us and introducing the benefits of laser trabeculoplasty through the LIGHT study. And following that, I will be talking about the SV mode laser trabeculoplasty, the science behind it, recent literature, benefits over drops, and a couple of interesting case presentations. Take it away. Hello, thank you, Dr. Shoham Hazel, for the lovely introduction. As mentioned, my name is Alin, and I will be talking to you today about selective laser trabeculoplasty, and in particular, the light study. Uh, the full title of the study is listed here, so it is Selective Laser Trabeculoplasty versus Eye Drops for First Line Treatment in Ocular Hypertension and Glaucoma. It was a multi-center randomized control trial that was done in the UK and published in The Lancet in 2019. Um, so the landscape of glaucoma treatment is rapidly changing and there is a paradigm shift towards earlier intervention. Dr. Ike Ahmed is a well-known Canadian glaucoma and advanced segment uh, surgeon who coined the term interventional glaucoma which refers to actively seeking treatments to optimize patient intraocular pressure rather than following a stepwise approach. The use of laser trabeculoplasty earlier on in treatment reduces the burden of patient medication use and also helps with the issue of non-compliance. So to talk about lasers in general, the argon laser trabeculoplasty or ALT was the original form and it was first described by Worthen and Wickham in 1974. A pilot study was then completed in 1979 by Wise and Witter. Then following that in 1990, there was a large randomized control, style, control trial, my apologies, um, where there, it was separated into two patient arms, one receiving Timolol and the other receiving 360 degree ALT treatment. The conclusion of the study was that ALT is as efficacious as medical treatment, i.e. drops, for treating early primary open angle glaucoma. So then to move on to laser, selective laser trabeculoplasty or SLT, this is a newer form that was introduced in 1995 by Latina and Park. SLT uses a 532 nanometer Q-switch double frequency YAG laser. And unlike the traditional argon laser, SLT uses a heatless laser that you are able to treat the desired area without collateral damage from the heat dissipating outwards from your treatment site. This allows for a more precise treatment and it gives you the freedom to repeat the SLT treatment if necessary. SLT was approved by the FDA in 2001, and it is thought to reduce intraocular pressure by increasing aqueous outflow through the trabecular meshwork. So this graphic here is from a Canadian study produced by the University of Western Ontario, which compared SLT to prostaglandin analog drops or PGA um, as a first line therapy to reduce intraocular pressure. The study was conducted over a 12 month period and compared the safety and efficacy of the two study arms. A total of 61 patients were selected for the study and it was a prospective multi-center clinical, clinical trial for patients who were newly diagnosed with either open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension. Selective laser trabeculoplasty was found to be equally as efficacious as the PGA drops in in reducing intraocular pressure over the 12 months. This study supports the use of using SLT as a first line treatment for patients with newly diagnosed open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension. So moving on to the LIGHT study. The LIGHT study was designed to question the current 
uh, clinical practice pattern. Um, as right now, clinical practice, the standard is to use drops as the first line treatment. And the study was essentially looking to see if FLT um, as first line could be comparable to the traditional treatment. So the light study was a prospective randomized control style that was multi-center. It involved six glaucoma clinics in the UK and data was collected from 2012 to 2014. The hypothesis of the light study was that SLT being used as a primary treatment for lowering intraocular pressure would provide better health-related quality of life. They also hypothesized that it may have a lower cost of care and uh, treatment toler tolerability would be better for SLT as there, were less of, there would be less of a need for drops. So the inclusion criteria of the light study were patients that were newly diagnosed with either open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension. The patients needed to be treatment naive, so they didn't have prior treatment for surgeries on those eyes. Uh, they needed to be at least 18 years of age, and for the study, it was important that they were capable to read and understand English. Exclusion criteria included those who had congenital glaucoma, anyone with glaucoma that was secondary to another disease, if they had additional eye disease, if they had ocular surgery previously that went above or beyond FACO, and if the MD was worse than minus 12 in their better eye or minus 15 in the worse eye. So for this, we are, it means that we are really looking um, to see how SLT could improve outcomes for patients when they were diagnosed earlier on and excluded those who had very severe disease. So primary outcome measures was looking at health-related quality of life at the 36-month mark. They also had a couple of secondary outcome measures, which included glaucoma treatment-related quality of life and clinical effectiveness. This was broken down into three aspects. So the percentage of visits uh, where there, the patient's intraocular pressure was at target, the number of treatment escalations required to achieve target IOP, and healthcare resource use. So here we have a graphic, and I have highlighted a couple of um, numbers here, as it is showing that SLT results in superior intraocular pressure stability. And as you can see, 74.1% of patients in the SLT arm were successfully controlled after a single treatment. So that means that after one SLT treatment, 74% of patients at the 36 month mark were still within their target intraocular pressure. And the second square that I've highlighted here, you can see that fewer drops were required to maintain intraocular pressure as a total of 78.2% of SLT patients did not require any medications at the 36-month mark in order to maintain their target IOP. So this graphic here depicts secondary outcomes of the light study. And in the top left color corner, it is showing health-related quality of life. Below that is the glaucoma symptom scale. In the top right corner, is glaucoma utility index, and below that is glaucoma quality of life. You can, so you can see here that the secondary outcomes are quite comparable between the drops as well as SLT, um, but based on analysis of the data done within the light study, it is generally suggested that the SLT group had better secondary um, health-related outcomes and quality of life. So this graphic here highlights adverse events from the study. There were more ophthalmic drop related adverse events reported by patients in the eye drop category with a total of 150 events reported. And those were reported by 73 different patients where in compared to the SLT arm, there were a total of 30 events reported by 20 separate patients. So 
This is depicting the benefits of SLT. So SLT provided better intraocular pressure control at more visits. So over the three-year span, the total number of visits that um, everyone had, more patients in the SLT arm were at their target IOP during those visits. SLT patients required fewer treatment escalations. There was less disease progression among these patients. They had a less intense drop regime, as noted before, where 74% uh, were drop free at the three year mark after a single SLT treatment. There were no glaucoma symptoms and there were less cataract symptoms. So this is the first study that reports disease control without topical medication provided by primary SLT and does so with realistic but stringent targets for intraocular pressure and objective escalation criteria. So there were no systemic adverse events reported from SLT patients. There was one patient in the SLT group that had spiking intraocular pressure, which required treatment. Overall, SLT is cheaper than drops, and it was calculated to be approximately by 450 pounds per patient. So in translation, this means for every patient given SLT first instead of drops, the cost savings are greater than the cost of SLT for two additional patients or equal to the cost of five additional ophthalmology specialist appointments. So the light study produ produced results that are applicable to daily life. The design lays out how they calculated target pressures. It took into consideration disease progression and treatment escalations. They used strict decision-making protocol with fixed follow-up appointments, which makes it simple to implement this framework into daily practice if you choose to do so. Um, so primary selective laser trabeculoplasty is a cost-effective alternative to drops that can be offered to patients with open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension needing treatment in order to lower their intraocular pressure. And I will now hand it over to Dr. Shoham Hizam. Thanks, thanks, Alind, for the simplification of a very complex study, which changes our, our thought about um, laser trabeculoplasty in general. And I will be talking about the advantages of laser trabeculoplasty, and particularly during our COVID era. So these are my financial disclosures. And this is actually my, my laser machine. So I, I do have a LightMed um, tri-laser, which basically has um, the argon portion on, on the right hand of my table. But the, the tower itself has both the YAG and SLT portions. And for me, just to transition between the YAG and the argon, we have just this small console to move to the side. The table is super easy to maneuver. It's in one of my lanes, and I just wheel it into to the slit lamp or close to. So it's, it's by far one of the easiest machines to utilize. And the optics of the slit lamp are just superb. So um, I'm very excited to, to have had it and actually bought it during COVID because there was no access to the hospital. So I'll start by basically discussing what is sub-threshold pulse uh, laser trabeculoplasty. So SV mode for LTP is a laser de delivery modality that al allows um, the fine or finer continuous control of laser energy delivered. If we have on the top of this um, image, the conventional or continuous wave treatment, whereby we deliver a continuous amount of energy constant throughout our uh, treatment, which also raises the collateral thermal energy and temperature, using the SP mode, either with retina, but we're dealing with glaucoma or laser trabeculoplasty, this allows kind of small spurts or bursts of energy, allowing the tissue to cool down in between the laser applications. So as I said, the SP mode takes the continuous wave laser emission and chops it into short pulse, pulses of, of energy. 
these uh, short pulses allow an on time, which is the energy delivered, and the off time, which allows an interval between the pulses at which time the collateral tissue or tissue adjacent to the laser application is allowed to cool down and basically not heat. And we have our little spots here on the right of the table. So this off time, as I said, allows the tissue to cool down and prevents collateral tissue damage, which is mainly our concern, for example, traditionally, when we did ALT. So ALT, we know, did cause some collateral damage and we couldn't repeat it. Doing a sub-threshold laser allows us to, first of all, repeat, but prevent any um, collateral damage to tissue. The literature dealing with micropulse laser trabeculoplasty or the sub-threshold mode for trabeculoplasty is very, very limited. <clears throat> I will present two studies, but the literature has potentially less than a handful of studies. This study discusses SLT versus MLT in open angle glaucoma. The aim of the study was basically to prospectively compare efficacy, safety, and tolerability of SLT versus the micropulse mode uh, in reducing intraocular pressure in open angle glaucoma patients. Um, and this was a year long study. So the follow up was for one year albeit somewhat of a not a robust data, so only 36 patients, 38 patients, sorry. However, when we look at the data starting from week one to the week 52 to one year follow-up, we can basically see that selective trabeculoplasty, selective laser versus micropulse, basically showed significant or same results, sorry. So in terms of decline in IOP, both modalities had the similar result, and we can see that the p-value here is not statistically significant. When we look at the percentage of decrease in IOP, although it seems like there's um, a trend of maybe SLT lowering more the IOP, these um, data are not statistically significant. So the difference between the percentage and reduction was comparable between SLT and the SP mode of laser trabeculoplasty. In conclusion, the micropulse laser trabeculoplasty is a novel therapy in the treatment of open angle glaucoma. The results from this head-to-head -head comparison between the SLT and the micropulse or SP mode provides evidence that micropulse laser trabeculoplasty is similar to SLT in delivering substantial IOP reduction over one year, and while providing less discomfort both during and after the procedure, and I will touch upon my post-op um, regimen. Another study coming out of Mexico City compared SLT to micropulse trabeculoplasty utilizing the light med laser. And this was a controlled prospective longitudinal clinical trial. And the objective again was to uh, compare MLT, but this is the light med laser. So it's the SP mode of laser trabeculoplasty compared to SLT in patients with ocular hypertension or open angle glaucoma. This study compared 67 eyes, 38 of SLT and 29 in the MLT group. Group one uh, utilized uh, the light med uh, laser, doing, uh, applying the laser over 180 degrees of trabecular meshwork, either superior or inferior, where group two was the SP mode of MLT going 360 degrees. Um, and this utilized the 577 nanometer laser. When comparing the data again, we saw that there is a significant decline in IOP in both groups. And we can see those results are comparable, about 20% reduction in IOP over three months. And also the number of eyes 
in percentage of reduction at three months compared between uh, both groups. So in conclusion, regarding uh, this short lit review of uh, SP mode of laser trabeculoplasty, we realized that the laser trabeculoplasty used, utilizing the SP mode allows a safer approach with no IOP spikes. IOP lowering is comparable to the other LTP modes. There was no need for any anti-inflammatory drops post laser because since this SP mode is so gentle on the eye, there's no inflammation. So I uh, used to in the past give anti-inflammatory drops for patients that had SLT. But today when I'm utilizing the SP mode of laser trabeculoplasty, I utilize no post-op anti-inflammatory drops because there's just no inflammation. And I wrote that one size fits all, so there's no need to change your parameters as there's no damage or concern for IOP spikes. So more or less pigment and trabecular meshwork where we utilized different energies with SLT, with the SP mode, we don't have to change our parameters. And in my case, where I have all lasers on one table, one machine fits all offices. So you have the YAG, you have an SLT, you've got the SP mode of laser trabeculoplasty, which utilizes argon. Mine is a 532, so it's a green laser. And you can still do um, SP focal or grid. It's not grid, so my, my mistake. But I utilize it for retina um, and macular treatments as well. So what are the benefits over drops? So the light study showed us that the laser trabeculoplasty is superior to drops in terms of compliance. And we know that that is a major issue, compliance and adherence, patients actually getting the script and going to fill it at the pharmacy. We know that there's always an issue of patients applying drops. I know myself, I've got dry eyes. I don't adhere to putting artificial tears. Better health economics. So we know that laser trabeculoplasty um, allows our health economics not to suffer from us treating glaucoma, but also the patients going and filling prescriptions. It is definitely repeatable because we know that there's no collateral damage done to tissue in comparison to what we even see with SLT that we see the small champagne bubbles. When you do the sub-threshold pulse mode of, of laser trabeculoplasty, you see no tissue interaction or reaction, which is pretty brilliant. There's no patient factor in the treatment, which helps compliance. And since some of us are in different stages or different waves of COVID, there's least interaction with patients. SLT or ALT usually required a one hour IOP check. So there's no one hour IOP because you know you're not getting an IOP spike with SP mode as it is safer. And there's no post-op drops, so you're not sending the patient to the pharmacy where potentially sick patients can be. And overall, we get less office visits with this form of laser trabeculoplasty. So I have two case presentations that I'd be happy to share with you. And they're somewhat of an unusual two cases, so probably these wouldn't be my first uh, cases to do late. Um, a new modality on. So the first lady is a 67 year old white female referred for consideration of FACO MIGS. Um, she's got secondary open angle glaucoma, secondary to elevated um, EVP um, with a um, negative uh, workup. So she's had a, a workup to see where her elevated venous pressure is coming from. Um, it was negative. Best corrected vision in the eye in question in the right eye was 2025 with a mild myopic refraction. Her IOP in her right eye was trending up and it was at 21 millimeters of mercury on already three drop classes. She had only mild visual field uh, disease with moderate 0.8 cup to disc ratio. And she wasn't really keen on having surgery. And as we said, vision was still very good. So she wasn't really feeling um, either the disease or an early cataract. 
And she came to me, as some of you know, some of our patients kind of Google or speak to Dr. Google before visiting their um, ophthalmologist. And she heard that there's this new la laser, which is all the rave. So she wanted to try that new laser. And we did proceed with her right eye with a subthreshold laser trabeculoplasty. Um, and in my opinion, it was low risk enough for Spike that we didn't actually have to do an IOP check for her, a one hour IOP. She is now six months out, still on her three drops, but her IOP now is definitely on target with a significant drop in IOP. And we were actually both pretty happy. Being a glaucoma specialist, I don't think we're always keen to operate on elevated EVP uh, glaucoma patients. So that's the first case with a good happy ending. Second case is again a 74 year old white female, uh, which was followed by myself for primary open angle glaucoma. She had undergone phaco KDB on the right eye and a phaco GAT with a goniosyniculisis on her left eye. And during surgery, you kind of know which way it's gonna go. So she had her Schlem's canal was scarred and I didn't get any heme reflux from trabecular measure for Schlem's canal, which kind of indicates to me that mm, we're gonna need something else in the future. Best corrected visual acuity after her cataracts were 2020. IOP on the right eye with mild disease was on target, but was starting to trend up in her left eye, and that eye had advanced disease. She was still off drops and was not keen on getting back to her drops and asked if there's another option. So we proceeded with a SP mode of laser trabeculoplasty. And remember, this is a patient that had a GAT procedure before, so she had a MIGS or an angle-based MIGS before. I usually pre-treat my patients with iopidine. And I apply usually about 120 or so uh, laser applications or a minimum of 120. I go 360 degrees of confluent spots. The spot size is 300 microns, so all these are constants. The 300 uh, milliseconds of duration and 1000 milliwatts power at 15% duty cycle. So these are constants. I don't change them and I just pray for good results and the good results do come. So we went with a left eye SP laser trabeculoplasty. We did do a one hour IOP check because her pressure was already above target with an advanced uh, disease. So those patients, I typically do um, a one hour IOP check just so I can sleep better at night. And of course she did not have an IOP rise after her laser. We're six months out as well, and her pressures are on target at 12 millimeters of mercury with no drops. So this one is an SPLTP post-GAT, which is a very good option and a totally happy ending. We're ready to take some questions. I would like to uh, thank Jennifer and Lightman again for allowing us to participate in, in this webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Shohamazan and uh, Alain. That was very informative. And uh, we do have a few questions coming in. You know, I, I actually had some questions myself and throughout the presentation, it was just so clear um, that you answered half of my questions already, but thank you so much. I did want to touch on a few points though, and if you could elaborate a little bit more um, because we do have a lot of SLT users that are interested in bringing SPLT into their practice. And as you mentioned, you know, the parameters are the same, which is, um, you know, very reassuring to our new users. Um, however, do you have any advice as to um, anything different in between the two procedures that you could elaborate a little bit more on? Yes, so I do have access it's built on my brain. So I have access for, to both SLT and, um, and the SP mode of MLT. Um, that is in my office. In our hospital setting, we do have a proper SLT machine. And I'm 
utilizing SLT, and, and I, to be honest, I um, I graduated from my glaucoma or from my residency in 2010 and glaucoma fellowship after um, three years in around 2012 or 2013. I have never did ALT in my life. It was always SLT. And being a glaucoma specialist, you tend to maybe do more or less SLTs. And you sometimes, you know, get a spike. Um, so part of a study that we're contemplating on doing is comparing SLT to, to the SP mode or micropulse laser trabeculoplasty. I still think SLT is an amazing choice. And if it were my eye, I would probably have either. Um, but you might want to select sometimes if a patient had maybe three SLTs, they, then you might want to do an MLT on them or an SP mode LTP. So I don't think if you have an, an SLT, and again, your guys' light mid um, laser, the optics are so superior that, that it's almost fun to apply the laser because you're not struggling looking for, for the TM. And when you put the gonio lens, everything is so clear. So really there's a, I actually, um, I had retinal laser with this laser by one of our senior ophthalmologists who's had, um, who's had experience of 30 years with, with lasers. And when he just looked through the laser, <clears throat> I was actually the second patient to be done on that laser. Um, he was like, wow, the optics are so superior. So if you have a light med SLT or MLT, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter, both are brilliant. The advantage that I see to the SP mode or having the argon, whether be it the yellow, red, or, or green laser, that you can do much more with it, right? You can deliver laser trabeculoplasty, you can deliver retinal laser, whether it's uh, subthreshold macular, oviol, um, or, or frankly use it for, for retinal tears um, with a continuous mode. So it, it, you once you get that machine, and it's, it's not really a promotion because I, I looked at all the options and I said, you know what, it's COVID. No patient wants to go into the hospital. Frankly, I don't want to go into the hospital because, because it's risky. You're, you're not sure who you're going to encounter. So if you have an all-in-one laser and you saw in a fairly comfortable table in your office, you can't go wrong. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a few more questions. Um, does it work on angle closed patient? I believe closed angle glaucoma. So that's a very good question. And um, when we do SLT, the default um, spot size is 400 microns. So if you have a bit of a narrowish angle where you have to kind of turn or indent the cornea or gonio to get um, an open angle, when doing the SP mode of laser trabeculoplasty, the spot size is 300 microns. So it's a smaller spot size, which can fit into narrow angles. If you've got frank angle closure with peripheral anterior synechia, you don't see the trabecular meshwork, you've got nowhere to, to target. So frank angle closure, not a good option, but narrow angles, definitely, and definitely with an SP mode because we utilize a, a smaller spot size. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so with your experience with SPLT, um, would the power settings be the same for lightly pigmented eyes versus heavily pigmented eyes? So I, I don't have a lot of experience. I've done, and we've, we're starting to collect, we have about 150 patients or eyes that we've done laser to. Um, because you don't see any tissue reaction or interaction with a laser, I keep everything stable. I keep everything constant. So all my energies, duty cycle, um, exposure time, everything is absolutely the same. And I go still 120 um, applications. I know that some of the literature says 
um, that if you go under 120 applications, you're not going to get much of a response. If you're concerned um, in maybe the heavily pigmented eyes, you might just want to get an IOP, a one-hour IOP check on your patients. But doing the SPLT, um, I'm, we're not getting IOP spikes, even in the heavily pigmented, and we're still getting really good results with the non-pigmented eyes. So I keep it constant. I think one of the key points of doing SP mode, be it laser trabeculoplasty or SP mode for um, uh, trans sclera laser, you have to try and keep your energies um, constant. If you start tweaking too many things, at least early on, you might get into trouble. So I, I keep everything stable and I'm getting the results that I need. So for now, I'm not changing anything. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. Um, so we do have one more question and continuing to ask more. I'm open to the audience if anybody else has any more questions, but we do have one last one here um, for you. Uh, so both of you have presented a lot of good data using the um, 532 nanometer. And, and maybe you have experience or have you read anything else, but when using um, the yellow or infrared, or as you mentioned, maybe even red, um, do you believe that there will be a change in the parameters and the energy that you rec recommend to be delivered to the eye? I'll, I'll tell you for now, and again, because that's what the current literature is, is and where the current literature is at now, we're getting comparable results to SLT. So we're doing the SP mode LTP or laser trabeculoplasty, and we're getting comparable um, IOP lowerings. So for me at the moment, I, I wouldn't change anything. We are considering um, a head-to-head -head study of SLT versus MLT, um, maybe getting more robust um, data information uh, about the um, uh, SP mode LTP. So we might, you know, we might play around with some some different uh, values, but it seems like the company is bang on with with a um, with the values, and 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 I'm happy with it. So I don't know if you know maybe in the future we want to kind of explore um, utilizing some different values, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it, sort of thing. I mean, it works. Yes. Well, we do offer from LightMed as well the same kind of configuration as you've shown, the tri-laser. Uh, we have users that uh, have a diode or have a 577 for retina applications. And it's wonderful because, you know, after um, the presentation today, those users can go back and we could potentially, you know, try to gather some more data with more yellow or more infrared um, with this safe procedure, as you mentioned, um, and see if we can also get some good com comparable results. Uh, so I think um, for one last takeaway, um, you mentioned that, you know, this is repeatable and it lasts um, you know, we saw some follow-ups at the charts, as you've shown, one week, um, up to six months. So, I mean, how long does it last once your IOP is stable? Um, and, you know, after one year or two years, do you see patients needing to come back for another treatment as well? So what we've seen from the light study in terms of SLT, we know that it lasts for years. Um, I don't assume and I don't have experience of more than one year, but I assume it will probably be the same. So we will be safe for a good three or four years with one treatment. And again, since it's, it doesn't involve too much of a hassle, yes, it, it involves a, a, a clinic visit with a laser application, but there's no post-op care or post-laser care. If we have to repeat it another once or twice, um, I think I think it's still very worthy, and I think patients will definitely go for it. Um, another thing that the light that the light study taught us is that even applying a third application of laser trabeculoplasty still has a good effect or efficacy. 
almost like the first application. So if you have to go in for a little tune-up every three years, we do more than that in, to our cars, right? So I'm sure our eyes are, are as worthy. That's a very good comparison. And yes, as you both have mentioned, much far better than needing the medication, needing to go back and get refills and things like that. So I'm really uh, improving one's quality of life. So that's um, really was a key takeaway here that I have you know, taken from this presentation and I'm sure everybody else has, um, as you both have emphasized. So um, I will leave it at that, unless either of you have anything else to say. Um, I appreciate both of you being here this morning with us and uh, with this wonderful presentation. I do see some comments in our comment box that um, the presentation was great, very informative, and I look forward to uh, collaborating with the both of you in the future. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Thanks to Alin for, for doing this. I know she's got a very busy school schedule and I'm always very keen on interacting with whomever would like to email or ask questions. So you're more than welcome to, to share my contact information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. I um, know it's a busy day for both of you. So really appreciate your time and have a wonderful rest of your day and to our audience as well. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.